In this down period between Christmas and New Year's, this is a time when in the past I would probably be seeing quite a few of my, my family. And when I say my family, I generally mean my adoptive mother's family. And I'm going to tell some stories about one of those family members who's, who's actually been gone a very long time, but who made a massive imprint upon not just my life, but the life of so many other people within the family. And that is my uncle, actually great uncle, Hubert. Everybody called him, you know, Mononc or Mononcubai, uh, because, you know, we're, my, my mother's family is French Canadian. And so Hubert Lemries, he was born in the early uh, teens of the last century, and he, he died, if I remember right, in 1990 or 1991 of, of cancer and complications from that. And he, he lived a pretty long and a really good life in, in many respects. He saw quite a few hard times. He actually, um, at one time, had a grocery store, which uh, was, went under during the Depression. Um, and uh, wound up having to work a good part of his life as a welder, although that wasn't his preferred job. He was, he was extremely good at it. And so, you know, let, let me start sort of at the start, not necessarily of his life, because I don't actually know that much about it. And almost everybody who could tell us anything about that has long since passed on. But I'll, I'll tell you about what it was like knowing him so he was always there, you know, as far back as I can remember. And I should probably give a little bit of background. So my my mother's side of the family, um, she grew up in Chicago on a block that was pretty much all either French Canadians or Menominee Indians. Just about everybody spoke French. And um, she was a fourth generation immigrant, you could say, because our great great grandfather came over to fight in the Civil War, ended up settling in in uh, uh, New England, and eventually in the nineteen, um, I think late twenties, early thirties, the family settled in Chicago, and so my my great uncle Hubert would have been the grandson of of that ancestor and it was his dad and mom who everyone called Mame and Pepe you know they, they were the grandparents to everybody they settled in Chicago brought all the kids with them and there was a lot of adventures we could talk about I mean Pepe actually put together a band and, and got a jalopy together and had the kids like bunch of neighborhood kids, you know, driving uh, all the way to the Rockies, playing. <laughs> There's all sorts of stories. And Uncle Hubert was, was part of those stories as a kid. Uh, he played the trombone, believe it or not. Our family's very musical. And so Uncle Hubert was one of the oldest of, of the, the kids. I think he may have been the second oldest. And Eileen would have been the oldest, and she married Raoul, uh, who was who was from Canada. And and this is what the family did: they would they would have um, spouses from Canada and bring them down to that part of Chicago where they lived. And so you know, my mom, her mom was from Quebec, as was her sister, who married my uncle Hubert. Two brothers married two sisters, and. Um, so, you know, you know, in a way she was, my mom was a fourth generation immigrant in a certain way. She was also, you know, like a second generation immigrant. And Uncle Hubert, as one of the oldest boys in the family who wasn't going to be a priest, which, which is what happened with two of the boys in the very big family, um, he, you know, went to grade school. I think he got through fourth grade at most, and then he had to drop out to start working uh, to support the family because everybody had to do something. The girls went, you know, all the way to high school. Um, the boys, most of them in that older generation, ended up dropping out. And so, you know, he started working and eventually he, he actually had a grocery store that he unfortunately had to run into the ground um, 
you know, because of uh, people not being able to, to pay at, at different times. And Uncle Hubert, one of the most important things to know about him was, although he had a very short education, he really valued literacy and really valued reading. And so he read his entire life. And he was probably one of the best read people that I've known. He's, he's a great example of the fact that you don't have to go to school necessarily to, to be intelligent and literate and to, to you know, learn what, what, what's available to learn. You can, in fact, do it on your own. And, and he did. And he was always curious about things. So it wasn't just reading, say, novels or stuff like that. He read the popular science stuff of his time. He was interested in astronomy. He was interested in, in history. He started buying National Geographics when he was quite young and collected them all the way up until his death. And, and when he died, they were there in his library going all the way up to, you know, 1991, I think. And because of his interest in reading and because he he valued it so much that when the rest of the family was say playing cards or doing stuff like that he would go and retire to read um he wound up being sort of like 11 that you know fertilized so many other people's imaginations and i'll, I'll give you some examples of how that took place so as a kid for myself he would always get me books at Christmas. And I loved that because I, I started reading when I was about three and I enjoyed the sort of stuff that he'd get me. Like, you know, they had these Alfred Hitchcock presents horror stories. He would also, for my birthday, get me magazine subscriptions. And they weren't like BS magazines, you know. Uh, they weren't the sort of things that would, would just appeal to... Uh, easy reading. He was like, "You're getting, you're getting Science Magazine for 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 your birthday, you know. Enjoy it." And and I would read this stuff, and I'd be like, oh, "This is amazing." That's like where I learned about games theory from, for example. And the 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 thing that was really cool about Uncle Hubert is he wouldn't just let you drop, borrow books. He had a great library, and he would let me borrow books, and 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 he'd never ask for them back. I took so many books out of his library. Um, and he'd give you books. He would come later on and he'd say, so what did you think of that book? What did you get out of that book? What did you learn? What did you like? What did you not like? And he actually kept notebooks that, that I found later on, long after his death, where every single book that he read, he had entries in there. And he would say what he liked about the book, what he thought was good. He'd give it a rating. He also did this with movies as well. And I still have some of them in storage. Now, he did this not just with me, but with everybody else in the family. And when we talk about the family, we're talking about this entire Lemrys clan going back to Mame and Pepe. So there were 13 brothers and sisters who survived. One of them died in the, the Spanish influenza. A couple of them didn't have kids. Two of them became priests. So that left about maybe seven branches, each of whom had anywhere from three to eight kids and all of those cousins that's my mom's generation they lived on the same block in the summer they went out to a farm in indiana that all these brothers bought where eventually they they would retire um and so they spent a lot of time together and and uncle hubert and Antonia were one of the childless couples so they were sort of like everybody's extra parents and and uncle hubert was the literacy guy he was the one who took my mom to not just to the library all the time, um, which he did with all the other kids, but he took her to DePaul to sign up for classes, to register, to go to, to, go to college. You know, and my mom, uh, she kind of took the easy way. She decided she was going to be a French teacher since, you know, she already spoke French as her first language. And... Um, so she, you know, she, she was going to blaze through her classes. But if it hadn't been for Uncle Hubert's influence, no, nobody else in the family was saying to their kids, you should go to college. If it hadn't been for that, I certainly wouldn't have been adopted into the family that I was because it was in college, going to, to a party actually, uh, that my mom met my dad, who was up at the U University of Wisconsin-Madison at the time. Uh, she met him through 
I think one of his friends knew one of her friends or something like that. And um, so Uncle Hubert was, he was somebody who really exemplified. He didn't just push, but he exemplified what it was to be a curious, intellectually active, literate person who didn't have pretensions, who realized that reading was something you got to do not as a profession, but in your spare time. You had to make time for it. And that it was valuable. Even if nobody else was going to value it, it was, it was worth doing, and it was worth doing well. And so, you know, he was an incredible influence in that way. But there were other aspects of, of Hubert as well that I thought were really great too. Um, another thing that, that he and I share in common is a love of uh, nature and horticulture and, and gardening and uh, particularly of, of flowers. And he was, he was a pretty amazing gardener. I remember, so I, I should tell you a few other things. Um, when he retired, and he retired from being a welder, and apparently he was an amazing welder. He didn't really like the job, but he had to do it to make money after his, his store failed. Um, but he could do things. And, and my family is a family of craftspeople. So when they say that he was doing things that were beyond them, they mean it. It's not just, you know, uh, hipsters playing around with, with torches or something. These were people who really knew their stuff. So he was, he was really diligent in, in his work. Um, so anyway, he retired. My grandfather also retired. And my uncle Ernie, great uncle Ernie, another one of the brothers retired. And there were actually five brothers who were supposed to retire and move out to this land that they had bought in, in northwestern Indiana near Rose Lawn. And three of them ended up doing that. They all bought Wausau homes. They actually all bought the exact same model of home, just with slightly different wallpaper. And, you know, like the, the appliances were different colors. That's, that's the, the amount that they, they uh, personalize the houses. And uh, Grandpa and Uncle Hubert's house were built basically side by side with a four-car garage in between them and then a deck on top of that garage. And at that time, you know, in their 60s, they, these were really vital uh, people. My, my, you know, grandpa and grandma, aunt and uncles. Um, and, and they, you know, they, they made this land, that, which was essentially just sand, into a, a really wonderful place, especially for me, because I spent many of my summers out there. And that's where we also had, you know, Easter and Christmas and all the family gatherings for our side of the, the Lemrys family. Uncle Hubert um, built shelves running through the whole basement and it was just stocked with books. As a matter of fact, when, when places were closing, like seminaries, they would just give him all of their books because he knew, they knew that it wouldn't go to waste. He would give them to other people or um, he would put them on his shelves. And so every time that I was there, I could go downstairs and find, you know, really cool novels or science books or science fiction stuff or, you know, the National Geographics that I was, I was talking about. And he'd let you read anything you wanted. Even if it was a little bit too adult for you, he'd be like, ah, it's fine. You know, there's a little bit of sex in that, but you know, it's not like you're, you're not going to get introduced to that sooner or later. He, he was, a, he was not a prudish guy, but he was also, you know, a really uh, good sort of moral voice. Going back to the gardening thing, though. So they, they bought this land and Uncle Hubert, the, now Grandpa and Uncle Ernie, they cultivated the garden garden, right? Everybody worked on that, including, including me when I was there in the summer. You had all have chores. But then Uncle Hubert did all sorts of other things. He planted rows and rows of roses. And if you've ever done roses, they're a lot of work. Man, I, I wouldn't want to do roses myself. And he planted lilies and irises and all sorts of other flowers, daffodils everywhere. I mean, the entire like spring season into midsummer, where there were flowers all, all over the place, hydrangeas. Uh, he planted lilacs that he took from the old farm and brought there. He had currants that I, I found, you know, um, the birds had eaten them and, and you know, the 
pooped out the seeds in the woods and I was able to recover some of the currants that he'd had originally. And unfortunately, when Uncle Hubert died in um, the early 90s, my grandfather was so overcome with grief that he actually plowed under all of those roses and, and currants and gooseberries and blackberries. Uncle Hubert had like he had raspberries, they were red and black and golden. Again, I cultivated those, finding the golden ones out in, in the local woods. And um, there was just so many beautiful things that, that Hubert did in, in the, the land. And then I eventually, you know, when my mother died, I used that, that money from the inheritance to buy his old house. And I, I was able to bring some of those things back into into being, you know, to cultivate them again. And so that was a, a way of connecting with, with him. And, you know, I went through his library and kept a, a good bit of his, his books. He was the one who actually introduced me to a lot of great horror and fantasy and science fiction. And um, so I, I, owe, I owe him a, a great debt. And he was a really gentle man. He was a really kind guy, um, very understanding. You could, you could really talk with him just, to, with just about anything. Um, now I, I'm going to finish by telling kind of a funny story. So uncle Hubert, you know, he was clearly like the head of the family when he was alive. And we had this very long table in the basement that I was talking about where the, the books were and, and all that. And that's where we would have all of our like family meals, um, particularly at Christmas and Easter, you know, birthdays, things like that. And he sat at the head of this massive table. Uh, which was probably about 20 feet long. And we'd have chairs all around it, you know. Um, that's also where we'd play cards and, and you know, do things like that. Um, at one time, it, it had been a, uh, uh, it came from some factory in, in Chicago. So we would, we would chitter chatter back and forth during meals. And we had quite a few people who were kind of like to stir the pot. In, in my family, including my mom, you know, I'll, I'll maybe tell some stories about her down the line as well. And they were arguing about something and I don't remember what it was. Um, and, and they turned to uncle Hubert to ask about something and it, it had to do with like the old neighborhood. And so this, this super gentle guy who, you know, you, you wouldn't expect him to ever have engaged in any acts of violence. They asked him, well, what was it like when you first went to Chicago? And he said, oh, it was really hard, terrible. The, and you have to understand that Chicago at that time was an, a city of neighborhoods, generally tied to ethnicity. And if you weren't of the right ethnicity, you would suffer. Like my mom, when she went to elementary school, the Irish girls beat her up, you know, just for not being Irish. And so he said, when we first moved there, we had a lot of trouble. The Irish would come into our neighborhood and beat us up and break windows and, you know, do all sorts of things to us. And then we figured out that we, we got some hoses and we filled them up with lead shot. And every time that the Irish would come into our neighborhood, we whipped the crap out of them. And then they left us alone. And then it was quite nice, you know, and our jaws dropped at the table because we're picturing Uncle Hubert, who at that time was like in his 70s, you know, we're picturing him and his brothers basically, you know, creating blackjacks and knocking the crap out of people in ways that probably injured some of them for life. And that was just the way it was back then, you know, and then he just like went right back to eating his soup and nobody really said anything about it. So there are many sides to, to these, these, these people in the Lemrys family, but uncle Hubert, you know, was, he was uh, always very encouraging, um, uh, not just of literacy, but about how are you doing in your life? He was very happy that I went to college. Um, it was, it was, it was fortunate. I mean, it was towards the end of his life and he was, he was suffering quite a bit. He had prostate cancer and it spread through the rest of his, his body. But, um, I was able to, you know, see him at least before, um, before the end when I, when I had got, I was out of the army and gotten into college and we were able to talk and that, that was quite nice. And then, you know, when he died, we, we came down and, and had his funeral and, and there were many people who had great testimonies about, about the guy. And we talked about him. We have a family reunion every year. And at that time, the family reunion, um, 
I think it had moved location, and so you know we we talked about him at the family reunion as well because he had been heavily involved with that. So he's somebody that I've been thinking about over the last couple days, you know, um, as I've had time to unwind and read and think about how I would have talked with him about some of the people that I'm reading now and what he would have made of them. And I'm, he's somebody who I'm very grateful for. I, I, you know, I think I can say that I wouldn't be who I am in any real way had he not exercise the the influence that he did on the entire Lamry's family and in particular on my on my mom and my dad loved him too you know um, because he's a very lovable guy and um, I don't know that I would be where I am today if it wasn't for his encouragement and example as as a person when it comes to reading and also when it comes to gardening and and plants and flowers in, in particular so that's my story about uh, Monon Kubai.